Hi, my name is Jack Davis. I'm going to be your flight attendant for today. Today we're covering transforming your photos anywhere, a Adobe-centric workflow, specifically focusing on Lightroom CC, often known as Lightroom Mobile, as well as um, Photoshop for iPad. Um, what we're going to be doing, first off, let me uh, say, as I mentioned before, when we just did our little warm-up session, that one URL that you're seeing up on the screen is the one thing that you want to remember in terms of uh, options for you to take away. Because inside that Lightroom CC shared album, which is what that little uh, URL will take you to, is where I've done screenshots for the rest of what we're going to be coming today, a number of them. Okay? So it's just a little way of sharing. So I'm going to start off with that. Has everybody gotten a photograph of that screen? Good, okay. So, to answer your question about what we're gonna be covering today, is it more focused toward capture or is it more focusing toward optimizing enhancing? It's more geared toward optimizing enhancing. I am gonna start a little bit talking about shooting and importing because that is, unless we've got the content, we can't tweak it or optimize it or enhance it or do anything else. So I'm gonna talk briefly about these first two subjects right here. Um, shooting, specifically a couple little tips uh, in case um, you all are not familiar with some things that you can do, especially for the iPhone. I'm going to be emphasizing the, uh, the Apple iOS ecosystem since a lot of what we'll be talking about is uh, Photoshop for iPad, specifically Apple-centric. Lightroom CC is available for Android as well as for iPhone, so it's not um, limited to one particular ecosystem. But I am going to be focusing on, on Apple because of the iPad that we have here. One of the really cool things in terms of shooting is what Apple has done with some of their widgets. So I'm going to start off with that. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and, and start off with that. Um, I would normally, but since we're recording, I would normally switch over to the iPhone and show you the actual screen. But I've got a screenshot um, here. and. I'm just going to pull this up um, rather than switch the uh, video feeds. So on your iPhone, when you are, have it turned off, you probably know you tap on it now and it wakes up. If you swipe to the right, it gives you the main camera. If you swipe to the left, it gives you these little widgets. And when you swipe to the left, you'll get something like this. You'll get something like this if you're cool and groovy like I am. Probably most of you are not as cool as I am, and therefore you haven't set this up yet. But when you sweep to the left, you have an entire whole range of applications that are available through this widget plug-in system that Apple has done. When you do there, you're going to get your maps and messages and a few other things that are default settings. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, you're going to see a little edit icon. What I'm going to recommend that you do is you go to edit, and you're going to find all the apps that are available as widgets, one of which is Lightroom. And with that at the top, you can see you can move them. Once you say, yes, add this as a widget, you can actually move it up or down where its position is. And I've moved Lightroom CC as the very first one. And you can see that it has a camera and a selfie camera, and it actually will show you the last picture you took in your camera roll. So the point of this, in terms of shooting, is that I can go like this and like that, and I'm instantly shooting raw images with my iPhone that will go right into my Lightroom CC catalog. The technical term for that is bitchin'. Okay? That is bitchin'. You should be doing that. I've got a number of other cameras. Focus, if you're not using Focus, Focus is, and I don't even know how to pronounce that, is really cool because it allows you to do uh, portraits with the shallow depth of field, but you're not limited to needing to do that trombone effect of, oh, come on, just, I know you can focus, and you're going back and forth. You can actually get really close to objects and still get that depth of field effect. So Focus um, is awesome. Also, it allows you to add that depth of field effect to something that wasn't even shot with a portrait dual lens system. Um, it is amazing at its automatic edge detection and, and uh, blurring of, uh, of images. Okay, so that's the shooting thing. Just if you're not taking advantage of the raw shooting capabilities of Lightroom, by all means, please do. Okay, 
Next, uh, import into Lightroom CC. The main thing I want to talk about in terms of Lightroom um, CC related to uh, that is up here, here, we're inside of, and I'm getting a little echo when I, when I look down, so I'll try not to do that. Let's see if I can shift this around so I'm not looking down as much. Excuse me. Um, how many of you actually have uh, been using um, Lightroom Mobile on a regular basis? Okay, most of you, three quarters of you. The rest of you will after today. It is awesome. Um, the things that I wanted to uh, mention, especially some things that are really um, cool and new related to um, Lightroom, is in the upper right-hand corner where we find select and your view options and sorting and creating a slideshow and things like that. If you hit select, this was talked about in the uh, keynote yesterday, that you now have the ability to do something like this. So if I click on an image that has an effect, this is a little high key effect that I created for an image, I now have that ability, if you look at the bottom, to have copy. So copy will come up and it saved all those settings to the clipboard. So if I come down to a different image, let's go ahead and we'll do this one, or this one, this one, this one, this one, or 50 wedding shots, you know, all that I want that effect to because I want to unify them. I simply come up here and then say paste. If you look at the bottom, we now have the first time to copy and paste previous edits to multiple images. Until this, this has really been the holy grail of a mobile workflow, right? Before this, no matter what you're doing, you're doing one image at a time. Even if you're using some sort of preset, you're still needing to open up every bloody image one at a time. And the thing is with this is that you don't have to have something as elaborate as this high key effect. It could be just an optimization, right? You're in afternoon shooting, you're out traveling, you've got this you know, awful midday light and you fix one image and you wanna share that with a bunch of images. So as an example, I could come up here and say paste, apply, and there's the image. This image happens to be way darker than the other one. But as you know, the great thing is that the effect is actually there. It's just going to be needing the exposure. So that ability to copy and paste, to go from here to here, virtually instantaneously, is fantastic. If we go over here, see, I was shooting this morning. Uh, right here in town, again, that same situation. So how this works is when you're looking inside one of your um, albums or folders, go up to the upper right, come up here and say select, click on an image, say copy, go to a different image or multiple images, and then say paste. This one also happens to have upright already um, associated with it. So we'll see it's, it wasn't really optimized for upright because I'm doing these very you know, wide angles um, on these shots. But it automatically fixed the color and tone from these different images. So, and again, I just can swipe through them, even the very dirty window that I'm shooting through. Okay, you get the general idea. If you're not, haven't been taking advantage of that and considering that it just was invented yesterday in terms of the release, you now will be, it is fantastic. So that's not really an import as much as it's what I consider kind of the first step in my workflow. If you have the opportunity to either use a preset or to use a copy and paste of some previous adjustment, by all means do it. Do not reinvent the wheel. Start off by optimizing your image by using a previous edit. Okay. Um, next, in terms of this, I'm just gonna jump right into, uh, like I said, uh, in terms of the automatic import, if you're shooting with the Lightroom camera, it automatically is gonna end up inside of your um, Lightroom CC uh, environment. 
If we jump back to things like all photos, there's all the photos that I took this morning, one that I took on the drive over here. Um, it's all there. You can see then that you can organize it into different folders and talks. If I find something that I wanted to add, um, the great thing is that using that same kind of select feature, I can select, and then you'll notice at the bottom you've got add to. So if I wanted to, I can add that to, say, my uh, mobile workflow or the Max 2019, add that, and now that is part of that scenario. So in terms of moving around and organizing in that main home screen, it's fantastic. Since this is a shared album, guess what? If you go to that URL, that image is there. That's how much it takes to optimize and, uh, and send out a series of images to clients, friends, family, or whatever. It's a fantastic, fantastic setup. How do you share things before we get into the actual nitty gritty of, of optimizing? With, once you've created an album, you can create an album or folder. Typically, album is what you're sharing, the difference between that and an actual physical folder. So create a new album. These little three ellipses to the right-hand side, this is where you can, one, store locally. If you're going onto a plane, you've got a series of images that you want to work on. You have no internet access to the cloud. What's the technical term for that? Bitchin'. That's just bitchin'. It's right there. You have the album. Click on it. Store locally, thank you very much. Um, and share an invite. Share an invite, you come up here and you can turn on the, uh, the setting that it's turned on here. There's the um, URL that I've already given you. Link access, anybody or invite only. You can have it set up so that um, Uh, allow comments, likes, show location, metadata, allow people to download it. Typically, you're going to turn that off if this is a client. Of course, they can still screenshot it. But in this case, I've allowed you all to actually just press on an image and download the screenshots that I'm giving. But um, I'm not allowing comments and likes because I don't like that. There's enough haters out there. And I know there's going to be, dude, you misspelled Pfizer. And I love you, but not that much. So anyway. There's another thing, not as much on import as this whole environment right here of uh, this, this um, organizational area of uh, Lightroom. Now what I want to do is jump to that third point, shooting, importing, optimizing. And this is what I call my seven-step tango for optimizing images inside of Lightroom. Um, you can take a screenshot of that, but again, that's at the URL, so you already have that in nice, glorious, full resolution. A uh, number of you have been using um, Lightroom Mobile already. How many of you um, are already Lightroom desktop-centric, either classic or CC? Okay, again, interesting. Probably half of you are using Lightroom. Three-quarters of you are using Lightroom Mobile. It doesn't quite make sense, but maybe by Lightroom Mobile, you're talking about the phone, you're shooting and stuff. How many of you are, in terms of your photographic workflow, uh, Adobe Camera Raw Bridge Photoshop centric? You're using ACR. Okay, another large number of you are doing that, which is fine. The great thing is, is that the engine that we're going to be covering right now that's built into Lightroom is exactly the same as what's built into Adobe Camera Raw. So if you use Bridge, look at a folder, select images, go into ACR, you are not a second class citizen. That is exactly the same, exactly the same features. Adobe has gone out of their way to make sure that it's not that situation. If you're a real photographer, you use Lightroom and we're gonna truncate ACR. ACR is exactly the same engine as Lightroom, both Lightroom Mobile and Lightroom Classic. So what we're gonna be covering today is fine for all three of those environments. And um, this is what I would recommend. It's what I use. It's somewhat, anytime that you're working, talking about a, a workflow environment, it's a little bit one of those um, blue state, red state, religious questions, right? We all have our different workflows and how we work um, with our imagery. The thing I'll mention, though, is that everything that I tell you will be right, and what everybody else tells you and what you've been doing is wrong. So it makes it very simple that this is the correct and only, no, being a smart ass. 
Um, but it, there is a reason to this. And if you ever have found yourself working on images, whether Photoshop or Lightroom and anywhere, where you have to do one edit, we'll say as an example, um, you do an exposure, and then you go into, say, dehaze, which is cool and groovy, and then you realize because that kind of plugged up your shadows a bit, you had to go back into your exposure or your shadows to refix that because you changed something. If you ever find yourself going back through your steps, you're obviously not maximizing your time. So the reason for this workflow and the um, order of this workflow is for exactly this reason, that I've geared this toward trying to get it so you never have to go back and backtrack through this scenario. So I'm gonna go real quick, I'm just gonna explain it, and then I'm gonna demonstrate it on multiple images. Okay, does that make sense? Nod your head enthusiastically? Okay, all right. So we already talked about it, copy and paste settings, zero, that's why it's zero, it's really not, you haven't started the process, but if you can, by all means, never ever, ever start from scratch if you can start with it. It could be that the only thing that you're saving as part of a preset is auto, um, auto fix, which is both your light and your color. Okay, it could be that, you know what, I always do these sharpening things. These are my favorite sharpening settings. These are my favorite things for middle of the day. Come up with, even if it's one or two things, if you're no longer having to ever sharpen again because you've got your three best sharpenings, right? Sharpening low light, sharpening middle of the day, sharpening whatever, small camera, sharpening, full frame camera. Whatever you do, figure out how you can come up with a series of presets that will start off your workflow, if not completely finish it. Okay, so that's zero. One, auto. Adobe continues to, and it's the number, by the way, that zero, I already mentioned to you where to find those copy and paste of presets, so that's on this screenshot here. Auto, you can see where that button is. Auto, Adobe continues to work with this new Sensei concept of using machine learning and AI to um, uh, enhance and uh, embellish their capabilities of their tools. And um, auto is one of those things. Auto has gotten so much better over the years. If you tried auto even a couple years ago and you go, yeah, nice, not really for me, thank you, and you've never been back, go try it. It is infinitely better than it was. It will continue to get better. If auto doesn't do what you want, you just simply undo, okay? So no harm, no foul. Always start with auto, especially what it's gonna do is it's gonna help with some tricky um, settings like contrast. Setting contrast is a confusing one um, to optimize that for the quality of your image. So anyway, audio, auto. If auto works, great. If not, undo, no harm, no foul. Two, jumping right to effects, not light. Hmm? Under effects, as you probably know, is where you're gonna find your local contrast enhancements, LCEs, okay? Why am I telling you geeky terminology like that? So you can meet somebody at a Photoshop bar tonight and get lucky. No, uh, that's what terms like oxidative phosphorylation and other things are for. LCEs, local contrast enhancements, where some pieces of software and multiple pieces of software have local contrast enhancements, fine areas of contrast and exaggerates that. And usually it's at different levels of radius around inherent edges or areas of contrast. As an example, texture, the new texture that came in a few months ago, is awesome and fantastic and it's working at a very tight pixel level. Hopefully you all have been using texture since it's come in. It is fantastic. Next in terms of this radius, this sphere of influence, is clarity. Clarity is also a local contrast enhancement. As You've probably seen it's great for popping texture and detail, but sometimes it can create halos because it's kind of in this nebulous zone where you can actually see that halo if you get carried away. Another one is dehaze. Dehaze also is this thing where it's uh, exaggerating the contrast in particular portions of an image. It also can get really aggressive uh, with some of its adjustments, but it's another one of those bitchin' adjustments that you just have to do. So, because of all of those are increasing contrast in specific areas of your image, including potentially darkening the shadow areas, this is why I have put the effects before going into your light panel. 
right? Does that make sense? Because if you go, hey, I love dehaze. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, oh, and a little bit of clarity in that texture. It's a landscape. Yeah. So by doing a little bit of the stuff that you know that you're going to do first, now you can see, OK, I have darkened my shadows because I got a little carried away with dehaze. And now, of course, we have all the wonderful, luscious goodness of the light panel with shadow and highlights and black point and all that stuff. So uh, effects before doing light. That includes vignette, as you're going to find in effects. And if you like it, a vignette, might as well throw it in there. If you know you're going to go there, might as well use it then. Light, shadow highlights, exposure blacks. Um, Shadows, highlights, self-explanatory. Exposure is your middle tone value. Great. It's what would be a skin tone in most portraits, or it's just your middle tone value. Uh, oftentimes, um, your auto adjustment will fix that perfectly. Shadows and highlights will be based upon what you just did with your local contrast enhancements. Setting your black point, that last thing that you see up there under uh, step three, is where you're going to, if you've gotten aggressive with, say, your shadow slider, right, pull in all this detail, you don't want muddy shadows. You want to be able to anchor that shadow to get a nice, rich black point. So remember that black point slider is essential for getting that crisp, full range uh, of tonality within an image. Color, white balance, shooting under artificial light, vibrance and saturation. You all know vibrance is intelligent saturation, right? It's going to be very judicious with oranges. All skin tones, no matter what ethnicity, fit into this orange range. It's cautious with that. A little aggressive with yellows and blues for our landscapes, but it's nice. So a combination of vibrance and saturation is still going to be great. Then moving on to our selective edits. You've already optimized the image. Now our dodging and burning takes place. We've got some cool stuff there. I say start with ovals. If your ovals are great, especially since you have an eraser so you can fine tune it. The great thing with ovals, if you've got multiple areas you want to work on, you can duplicate those ovals, move them around, reshape them, share the same settings all throughout the image, as opposed to using the brush, where the brush is obviously very specific to a certain area. So I like the ovals. It lets you work very, very quickly. It's like working back in the dark room. You guys don't know what a dark room is. Back in the day, there was this thing called film. Yeah, you guys don't know what film is. Anyway, in the dark room, we would put body parts and paddles and little pieces of paper and jiggle them in front of the enlarger to dodge and burn. It was big, soft, and subtle. And that's what I like about the ovals. Nice, big, feathered oval, I think, is a great way to do targeted adjustments to start. Six, optics and detail. That's where you can remove your chromatic aberrations. Another great word to use at your bar tonight when you're trying to share a drink with somebody. Uh, and your sharpened mask and noise. I'm going to touch a little bit on my settings for sharpening. I mentioned also it's kind of one of those blue-red state differences, right? Um, and my sharpening uh, technique is a little bit different from others, so I'll mention that with, with you. And then last, the healing brush. A uh, little note I thought I'd put in here just for fun. If you're using the healing brush, which automatically is bringing stuff from um, outside into a particular area, it already has its feather and blending built into it. Do not use a high feather with the healing brush. You will degrade the quality of your fix. Have that a very low feather. It's already doing that for you. It doesn't actually need any feather, but a little feather if you want. The clone stamp, where you're taking one chunk of something and moving it over another area, it needs a very large feather, because that's the only way it's going to blend that in. So there's a little tip related to that. OK. So there's are things related to my seven-step tango. Make sense? Nod your head enthusiastically. Yes, sir. So, uh, effects before light color is not obvious, so taste it. Not obvious. What about uh, uh, crop and straighten? You know, somebody mentioned that. He said, crop and straighten. Well, I don't even necessarily put that in workflow because that's a creative thing or a logistical thing. So put that in wherever you like. The one thing that is actually a good point of that is your histogram is based upon what's inside the crop. So if you know you're going to crop it, you have to have it as an 8 by 10 for the client. You know that it has to be this for Instagram. Or it knows you have to be something. By all means, put that way up at the top of your workflow because that's essential. You're, that's what you're determining. Also, if you know you're going to crop out something like a bright window that's not part of your story, crop it out first. That way your histogram will be accurate. And when you hit Auto, um, that will then reflect what is currently inside the crop. So actually, it's a very, very good question. I should add it up to the very beginning here, but it's not 
you know, that's kind of one of those personal things, you know, when you, where you put it. I'd, I'd put it in right at the top. If you want to, it'd be before auto. It would be part of zero. Even, you know, my pre-workflow would be to crop if it was one, there's something in the image that definitely, in terms of tonality, is not something, is you know you're gonna get rid of it, or you know the only time you're gonna use this image is an eight by 10. If you know you're not gonna use it in multiple aspect ratios, by all means, crop it right at the beginning. Very, very good question, thank you. Okay, so let's do this um, tango in, uh, in real life. Okay, so now that you got it memorized, Ah, you didn't think you were going to be tested in this class. No, no, no. What is the first step of our tango? <laughs> Man of my heart. I love that. Okay. Um, true, exactly right. If I had images, if I'd shot in a bunch, if I'd shot in, is the technical term, if I'd shot in a bunch of things at the same time uh, when I was down in the Grand Canyon, that's exactly what I'd do. If I'd already fixed an image, the last thing that I should do is start off, go to another image and start. So by all means, zero is absolutely right, which is your copy and paste settings or use a preset. If I wanted to, I could go, your presets is up here. And if I go to my presets, it gives me a nice preview. If I want to go, here's my general tweak, some of my general tweaks, one with upright. So if I go, we'll say there, boom, okay? Not bad, what the heck? Normally, at this point, people are throwing money up on stage and all that stuff, because that was really, really cool that you never actually have to do a workflow again if you just take some time and do some tweaks. Uh, I'm going to undo that. I'm going to cancel that, because we want to actually do it. But that's exactly why you would do it, is you would go, you know, if I've got favorite portraits, favorite landscape settings, favorite you know, golden hour settings, just make whatever you want. They will come up alphanumerically in presets, so name them appropriately. Landscape one, landscape two. Don't one landscape, you know, you get the idea. Okay, so um, the first step is that auto. Great, fine. Didn't harm the image, no reason why not to use that. If we look at light here, you'll notice that it actually made an adjustment to all six of those first settings. If we look at color, it also did an adjustment to both vibrance and saturation. Made a stab at it, looks better. It's not done, but why not? It's a great start, and it's actually doing things like that contrast, which, like I said before, is sometimes a little bit um, challenging to know where to go with some of those. Okay, and then that next step in our tango is the effects, the local contrast enhancements. We've got a, these you can kind of do in any order. Um, I would. That's up to you. The dehaze is the most aggressive in terms of how it can change the tonality of your image. So I'll usually you know, leave that a little bit uh, till later. Um, texture is um, this brand new feature where at a pixel level, it does a ridiculous amount of sharpening. Hopefully you can see that. Let's see if we can get even closer. So there's that. Okay. Without the fringing that you'd get with normal sharpening. So Adobe has done a fantastic job of um, this brand new feature called Texture. It's a landscape. I'm not going to take it up to 100, but you can often get away with a landscape at uh, 25, even 50. This is working off a drone shot, so it's a very small sensor. Remember that if you're working with a mobile phone image or with a point-and-shoot camera or something, you're going to have to compensate for the nature of a very small sensor. Okay, Clarity. Clarity we'll be able to see. So clarity is going to give us that pop. Okay, So I'm picking that up. I'm going to exaggerate it for teaching purposes so you can see it from a distance. So just keep that in mind if you're going, dude, 64 clarity? Again, that's where the haters come in, right? You just, you know, I would get messages if I allowed for you guys to message me. I think you're, anyway. Uh, Dehaze, okay, Dehaze. Dehaze is gonna focus on those lights in the sky. If I wanted to, again, here I'm gonna press on the screen, that's our before and after. So I like that, it's obviously, we've got a storm coming in, so that's what I'm kind of emphasizing with the story that I'm telling with this photograph. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, great, I, I like that in terms of that. In terms of vignette, 
I would like adding a little bit of vignette to draw the eye into the center of my story, so I use just a little bit to do that, just to keep it not as an effect as much as just a little bit so the eye doesn't wander to hot spots in the corners. So I use that a little bit there. Okay, that is step two. What was step three? Is the light panel, right? The light panel and everything within the light panel. So we go over the light panel here. It's already made some adjustments. I can see our, my shadow is not up as much as that could be. So I'm gonna do that. I'm going to my highlights, you see that light on the uh, far side of the canyon wall, so I'm going to take that down. Um, you'll notice that when I hit auto, since it didn't know I was going to get carried away with clarity and texture and dehaze, it's doing that based upon those um, not having done those settings yet. And because I can already anchor the uh, shadows and highlights and different elements by using those local contrast enhancements, Oftentimes, you will tweak, fine-tune these different settings in here, which I'm going to do uh, now as well. Same thing with the whites. That's an example. I'm going to take the whites down, even though auto set them up. I'm going to kind of reset those. I probably don't need those blacks to go down that far because I use my dehaze. Shadow and highlight are way up. And I think I, I like that there. I could take that exposure up a little bit. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave those canyon walls um, a little bit dark. Though my story is the foreground. In the back of my mind, I know I've got local contrast um, enhancements or, or targeted enhancements or selective edits down into something like the foreground. So I'm not, I don't need to cover everything with those, these six sliders. So I'm going to not um, worry about that exposure. I kind of like the overall exposure on there. And I've got my tonal range. Great. Next step. After light. Color. Okay. So color. The thing that why we have color down here is every single time you change the contrast in an image, by definition, you are changing color. By definition, you are adding saturation. There is no way that you can add contrast to an image with not bumping up the saturation at the same time. You are adding the contrast to the red, green, and blue channels in your curves dialog box. And when you do that, you will increase the saturation. So you should not do color. You may be tempted to go just jump right into vibrance and go, yeah, that's great. First fix your tone. Let color follow if you need to. For teaching purposes, if I want to get carried away, especially since I have so many oranges in this image, I'm going to emphasize vibrance because vibrance is very cautious with oranges so they don't go radioactive. Okay, and that's good. The white balance is fine. It's natural light, no problem whatsoever. Next is our selective edits. We have done the uh, main work on the image. We're going to go to the little teeny circle. I'm going to turn it on and off just so you can kind of see where it's at, the circle with the... Um, little marching ants, so to speak, around it. In the upper left-hand corner, this is a little bit different than on our desktop versions of Lightroom. This is where you're going to find your selective edits. You have a brush, uh, radial, and gradient. Uh, I'm going to come up here and just do the radial. As I mentioned, I like that. I'm going to drag out a nice big oval on my foreground where my story is. As soon as I do that, I have the eraser looking on the left-hand side. I can change the feather. I can flip the mask to the outside versus the inside. If I wanted to do kind of a manual vignette thing, then doing that by flipping the uh, uh, mask from the outside of the oval from the inside is fine. And of course, I've got a trash can to throw it away. In this case, I'm going to come up here to that light panel. And now I can come up here and maybe do a little bit of that exposure and maybe now do a little bit of that shadow, maybe actually shadow instead of exposure. Okay. And now if I want to get a little carried away with color, since that's my, where I want the eye to go down, and even going into effects, because I want to get carried away with that clarity and my texture, because again, that's my story. So in one fell swoop with one quick soft oval, I'm able to change the tone, the sharpness, the detail, the contrast, you guys know that you've been using these sorts of tools for a long time now, but it is great. And as I mentioned, the great thing is 
uh, with an oval versus a brush, if I press and hold, I can come up here and duplicate that and move it around to another little spot. There was a secondary camp up the river. I wanted to do a little pop on that. So the nice thing is that these um, vector shapes are easily copy and pasted around the document. Okay, and that's all I'm gonna do on that one. I say done. Uh, the optics, this is where we're going to find that remove chromatic aberration. Again, we're working with a small sensor, very wide in, uh, angle image, uh, wide glass, as it were, on the camera. So there's no reason to not. It's kind of a freebie. Always get rid of the chromatic aberration. Uh, we'll see. It does have the uh, profile for the little um, GoPro, uh, the uh, little, I'm sorry, DJI uh, Mavic. And actually, I like it without that. Adjustment. Last, our detail. So here we get that religious question about um, sharpening. So real quick, I'm just going to do it. I won't explain it. I won't justify it. Um, the main problem with this default setting is that it's wrong. It's bad. It's awful. It's yucky. Don't do it. The thing is, it's, it's starting off with a detail of 25. That's what's going to exaggerate any noise in your file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this, sharpening up, radius up, detail down, masking up. What did I just do? One, <clears throat> sharpening is your intensity. I'm going to probably adjust that um, a little later. Radius is the sphere of influence, can go up to three pixels. So if you've got a soft image, you can take that up to three. If you already have a nice image, nice glass, nice camera, by, the, by all means have that at a single pixel or less. Uh, I'm going to. I'll leave it here for teaching purposes, but the detail, okay, if you have your detail, that is where your noise is going to be exaggerated. Um, it's, a, it's a great thing if you're shooting tree bark. Um, by all means, knock yourself out. But by taking the detail way down, maybe, you know, two or three if you want it, but a very low setting, and then combining it with the mask that's only going to allow um, the, it's going to mask out the high frequency areas, the areas with a lot of detail, uh, and sharpen those only and not sharpen things like the subtleties in a sky, which is where the, high, the, the noise is going to show up, um, by all means, um, take advantage of that. Okay? So you can get away with a huge amount of sharpening, which I'll now fine tune down, but you can get a huge amount of sharpening out of a file as long as you remember to take your detail way down and then your mask way up so you're isolating out all the things, subtleties like sky. And because this is, I am using the dehaze and um, others, I am going to add some of this first noise reduction, which is luminosity noise. It's what looks like the film grain. And then I could even take that color noise up a little bit further if I wanted to. Okay. There is our before, after, before, after. If I thought this was a useful preset, I could save it, right? Do keep in mind if you're doing some targeted adjustments as part of it, you probably don't want to save those as a preset because those are specific to a particular image. But by all means, if this was a afternoon golden hour preset, landscape one, whatever you want, knock yourself out. And healing, you all know about healing. Um, so again, I'm not going to get too carried away with this. And why is it not showing? Don't know. And because of time, I'm not going to spend time figuring it out. As you've seen in some other demos, sometimes it's just best to, best to cut your losses and move ahead rather than Sherlock it out for a half an hour to figure out why in the world the healing brush is not working at the moment. Hmm, a mystery. Come up afterward, we'll figure it out. So um, there is a, a tango and um, how you can do it. If I were to... Actually, I'm not going to do the tango on another one. I'm going to jump to some other images because we've got um, quite a bit I still want to do. 
um, like geometry. Geometry isn't part of my tango because that's specific to a very specific shooting area. In this case, a panorama looking up. You can see that I'm not on a uh, level tripod, right, because the horizon line isn't in the center. So I'm looking up. So obviously the masks are, are going here. If you haven't used geometry and haven't used the guided upright feature, it is awesome. So I'm going to go to the horizon line and one of the masks, and boom. Okay? You obviously, some of you haven't been using that. You will all be using it now. It is bitchin'. Thank you very much. It is bitchin'. Especially because the alternative to this would have been me trying to figure out some other little weird angle, and it's simply not needed. The upright is fantastic. Even, not when, you're, even when you're not fixing something, uh, you can use it for the automated things, like up right here, I'm just gonna use vertical, and it automatically fixes the image, so you can let it do that, and then I'd crop that off. Or it could be that you wanna do creative. This is a pier that had three pylons. Here's the center one, the one on the left, it's looking down is what I wanted, but it's not symmetrical, and I'm all about symmetry. So why couldn't you come up here, do one here, one here, and add another one here and get it as if the pier was totally different shape than it actually was. So whether it is for fixing an image or some sort of creative tweaking that you wanted to do, knock yourself out. It is built into it, it's great, it's quick, it's non-fattening, why wouldn't you? Okay, so let's see. Some selective color. This is a, this a last year. Anybody here was in my talk last year at Max? Okay. Well, you know, what I, I did kind of a best of old time stuff here, and this is kind of similar where I'm going back through um, some stuff. This one, I may have even covered that uh, last year because it's so great. It's built into your color setting with inside of Lightroom, and it's this little teeny rainbow circle. That's our HSL. If you're used to your desktop Lightroom, which you all are, that's where we find our HSL panel. And the great thing is, is that I can come up here on the color mix. I can use our targeted adjustment tool. And down here, whether hue, saturation, or luminance is chosen. I wish this was a little sharper uh, screen, but hue, saturation, and luminance, you can see that down at the bottom. So if I come up now and just drag within the image, I'm able to change the hue of whatever I click on, okay, instantaneously. It's not a background tweak tool, it is a blue tweak tool. If I jump over to saturation and want to bring that down, I can do that. If I want to take that saturation up, I can do that. If I want to completely take it into grayscale, I can do that. If you haven't been using this tool, you should be. If I want to take that and do that, let's go to luminosity, let's darken that up. And while I'm on luminosity, click on the bridesmaid skin, I want to lighten up her skin tone, I can do that. I can lighten the background and give her a suntan. You get the idea. HSL is bitchin, bitchin. Okay, so I highly recommend that you use it. Also, another uh, use for HSL that a lot of people don't do in terms of their workflow, whether mobile or desktop, is take advantage of this for um, fixing an image. In this case, we've got some rosacea as well as jaundice. <laughs> it's a lovely friend of mine. This was his real estate agent. This was his business card. And I saw it and I go, dude, <laughs> I need that image. Why? You'll find out. Um, so between the little bit of rosacea, it could be a sunburn, it could be freckles, it could be whatever. If you want to kind of soften this transition between, oops, let me undo that. I was going to zoom in here, but I've got my targeted adjustment tool selected, so I'm going to turn that off. So what we have here is that red is a different hue than the oranges of his major skin tone, and there's a little bit of yellow, actually, in, his, in the skin tone of this photograph. What we want to do is move the reds toward the oranges and the yellows toward the oranges and have them meet in the middle and shake hands and be friends with each other. 
So with the red active, I can shift that hue, and you, if you look, it's kind of hard to see on that bar, but it actually has the colors built into it. So it's magenta to orange with red in the center. So all I need to do is shift that over and say that I want the reds more orange. I can go over to yellows and shift those yellows toward orange, and they meet in the middle and do and a great job of unifying, unifying skin tone. The thing is, is that red is not only a different hue than yellow or orange, it's also darker and more saturated by definition, the actual hue itself. So I can come up here again and go to luminosity on the red, take that up, and that's going to again reduce the rosacea, and I can even take that saturation slightly down for the reds. So here's my before, after, before, after. What's the term for that? Class? Yeah. Okay, make sense so far so good? Is this working useful for you guys? Okay, um, we'll do one more related to this and now we're kind of getting into what I mentioned before of not optimizing, now we're enhancing the image. Right? We kind of left the tango, the tango was our optimizing. Now we're doing enhancing, whether that's using geometry or we're doing some creative color work, um, we now are enhancing. This is a shot Julianne took for one of her other uh, topics related to this area of focus. I use it um, inside of Lightroom because very few people do a changing of the depth of field of an image in Lightroom, even though it's possible. What I mainly want to do is teach um, you the concept that Lightroom is a database manager of spreadsheet math. That's all it is. It's not a pixel processor. It's not a pixel pusher like Photoshop. It is a procedural processor. It's the process of the sliders that's being remembered. Even when you paint with the healing brush or the uh, adjustment, uh, one of the target adjustments, you are still doing procedural work. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go to my um, targeted adjustment. I'm gonna do a adjustment down here and I'm gonna go into detail and I'm gonna take the sharpness all the way down to zero. So now I've got blurring slowly graduating, going down to um, sharp. If I say done, you'll see that that is now out of focus and it comes down to a focus in the foreground. 100% unsharpened, un unsharpness minus. What happens if I go to the target adjustments, come up here, do one of my ovals, come up here, and say detail sharpen plus 100. They negate each other out and now I've got a razor sharp foreground. I haven't over sharpened it, even though I give it 100, because mathematically it just balanced out the spreadsheet of minus 100 to plus 100. That works out throughout Lightroom. It is really great to know. Desaturate with one tool, resaturate in another tool. It's very, very cool. I wish I had more time, but you get the concept. Because I've got this um, here, I could then come up here to the eraser and fine tune it around the edge of the pier, pier if I wanted to. Make sense? Okay, great. Um, Photoshop for iPad. It's awesome. Hopefully you guys absolutely loved the, uh, um, the demo that first day, which I thought was awesome. What I'm gonna use it for, obviously, is things that Lightroom can't do. You just saw a ton of things that Lightroom can do. I would say you're gonna spend the vast majority of your time related to photography. If this was a graphic design class, we would have spent most of our time in Photoshop, right? Not in Lightroom. But Adobe specifically wanted me to emphasize photography and you're gonna spend most of your time there, except for things like heavy retouching or some special effects which are not available inside of Lightroom. So let's do a, uh, start off with a retouching one. World's most beautiful mother, sorry, no offense to your mother, but my mother is better looking than yours. Um, but I want to minimize this, the next scenario here. So I'm going to come over here to my lasso. I'm going to come up and I'm going to just drag around that image right here. And I'm going to come up and I'm going to copy that. And down here, I'm on the right-hand side, if you can't see where I'm at, that little three dot, dot, dot thing, I can deselect. 
That's that context sensitive menu. Once you do something and there's some options associated with it, it automatically pops up. Very, very cool. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna say paste. So I've now got that little patch of skin, which is a disgusting visual thing to think about, but it really, really useful when it comes to retouching. You guys have probably done things like that. Right above the lasso tool on the left-hand side, I'm gonna to click to the transform tool. And now I can come over here and you see that little dangling line at the bottom, that's where we can rotate it. So now where you can't rotate, even though you can do retouching inside of Lightroom, you can't really come up and do, um, you can't really do a lot related to, you can't do anything in terms of layers, and you certainly can't come in and rotate and do a subtle patch and things like that. So I can say done. The other thing that's nice with layers is I can go to that layer and I can duplicate that layer. So now I've got another version of that. I can hit the transform, move it over, rotate it again. Again, why when I do this? Because I can't do it in Lightroom. You're gonna spend the majority of your time inside of Lightroom, but here I hit done, go to my eraser, and there is my image. We've got our little eyes on the other, on the right hand side to turn off visibility, turning back on visibility. There is a little patch to minimize that kind of um, neck area. Make sense? Okay, so again, what we can do, we have nice, soft, subtle selections. The main thing that Adobe has done with um, Photoshop for iPad is worked on compositing and uh, retouching. Those are our main things, plus the uh, typography. They've added, as you've probably seen, all your type uh, that's part of the Creative Cloud is available inside of um, Photoshop for iPad. You can load it in through the Creative Cloud app. Okay, so another one that we want to do that you guys, that we don't have inside of Lightroom, we don't have a Orton effect, right? A, a, a diffuse glow, a glamor glow. Very easy to do inside of Photoshop. You guys have probably been doing it forever. I'm just gonna do it here, come up here. We're gonna duplicate that layer. There is one filter inside of uh, Lightroom, uh, Photoshop for iPad right now, which is the Gaussian blur. We're gonna come up. I wanna still see details in the file. I don't wanna completely hide noses and eyes and things like that. So I'm just gonna simply give it a little bit of a blur. And then we're gonna take advantage of our properties, if you look right below on the right hand side, there's that little sliders. That's gonna give me all the layer properties, including blend mode. So I can come up here and use something like overlay if I want an exaggerated glamour glow, or probably soft light is gonna be fine. So here is the image and I'll hide it. So to be able to do a quick glamour glow to an image while you're on the road is awesome. It is available because you have the ability to duplicate and filter layers inside of the new um, Lightroom. If I wanted to add a new adjustment layer, because maybe I want to go come up here into my uh, levels and do a little brightening of the image, rework the shadows or whatever, I can do that as well because we have our adjustment layers. Very, very cool. Okay. Let's do another little thing where you would use Lightroom as opposed to in Photoshop. Um, speaking about compositing, actually let's do another one that I think is, is a little bit more fun. Um, yes, that's the world's most handsome son and my good friend, Dwight Jones. If you know Dwight Jones from Basic Jones, Outdoor Photography Magazine, um, I teach with him every year in Hawaii. We have a uh, retreat, creative photography for the soul. You are all invited. Let me know if you'd like to come. It's by invitation only. Um, but here I'm gonna jump in, and again, using that same kind of compositing, I'm gonna come up here, rough little edit. That same thing on the right here. We're going to copy and paste. If we look in our layers, we've got our little hair going on here, go to our little move tool. Yes, you knew where I was going with this. This is how you entertain small children on the plane with, light, with Photoshop for iPad, right? You do this. Go to our little transform, 
Okay, come up here, slightly different. You get the idea. You've all done this. It's the third eye and the forehead. It's the transplanting hair. Why, all, why wouldn't you do that? Say done. Of course, what we're going to do is add a mask, looking on the right-hand side, right below the little eye. You can turn off the uh, layer properties. Add the mask. Go to our little paintbrush. We know that black is going to hide. Let's make sure that we've got a, a nice feathered brush. We don't need that big, but we do want it nice and feathered. And you get the idea. Okay, maybe a little bit of it. And again, we 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 do have. The, the clicking right here, you can see where my cursor is, that changes the feather of the brush, and that also, I've got an issue, I've got my own hardware issues. But you get the general idea of that, I would just blend in the, uh, the skin tone a little bit more. But compositing, again, any heavy lifting retouching is not gonna be inside of Lightroom. So the fact that you have it built inside of your um, Photoshop for your iPad is absolutely fantastic. Let's see if there's something else I can sneak in here. Really, really quick. I should probably do a question. Let's just do a question because we literally are at two minutes. Okay, questions related to um, iPad and Lightroom. Yes? You're going to have to save the file. Right now, the two main um, apps that are using the uh, Creative Cloud documents uh, is Fresco and iPad. Those are the first two where it's been uh, implemented. Lightroom has its own sharing within its own ecosystem. Um, so there's not an, a, an instantaneous way of doing that, aside from saving it and then reopening it. Um, you did mention, you were the one who had asked about, which was a good question, uh, about um, Lightroom and saving it out. So that actually is appropriate that we jump back there. So we're going to come back um, to our image. And we'll say done. We're going to hit the export in the upper right-hand um, corner there. Save to camera roll, that's probably what most of us do, and you'd mention that you've got the low res and, a, and maximum in there. But this right below it is save to files. And remember, if you're in a, uh, the Apple ecosystem, um, its iCloud is its files. If you go on the left-hand side on your desktop, you're gonna find that folder. So you can put images into there or take them out of there. But if I come up here and save this to files, I can now do the same thing, um, maximum or whatever, and it is now inside that folder. It's not inside my camera roll, but it, I have access to that. And many of the Adobe applications have the ability to both open and save to files. So even though you can't necessarily use all of what will soon be Adobe's you know, system-wide Creative Cloud uh, document setup, um, you can use um, Apple's as a default. So Adobe has gone out of their way to, um, to do that in terms of that. If you um, export original, you can also, that would be your exporting of your raw file to files. So um, when you export original, you have that ability to save the raw file out to what would be basically your desktop uh, on the Macintosh or any other app that supports files for an open. Okay, very good question. Last question. If not, you can come up and ask questions. So on the slider, when you're adjusting length, when you're doing all this, the adjustments that you're making? Yes. When you double click it, it goes to dead center, right? Reset? Um, in terms of, I believe they've got that on, on all of them. Yeah. So that, that's working just like on the. It is not, but actually, now that's a good point. Let's actually bring that um, up because um, Adobe has gone out of their way to put the majority of the keyboard shortcuts 
and gesture shortcuts into um, the system if you have a keyboard hooked up to your iPad, as well as a mouse. If you buy yourself a Bluetooth mouse, which I highly recommend, and use that in concert with a uh, keyboard hooked up to um, iPad Pro, uh, Photoshop for iPad, um, you can use um, the majority of the shortcuts through keyboard and even right-clicking on a mouse. Um, all of those, uh, actually up here, we've got our more tools and features. Uh, I'm looking for the shortcuts. It could be here. It's a very good question. Settings, organize. I'm sorry, I don't have that on my. Uh, yeah. Um, that's showing it. That's what I'm doing while you're seeing. But to get the list of it, Um, I'm going to have to look at that. It is um, available, as you, and you know what? I actually have all of them, uh, did screenshots, all of them. I'll add them to the album that is at that link, right? It'll have all the shortcuts, both the gesture shortcuts um, and uh, the other ones related to keyboards and mice. So it's a very good question, um, and a number of those are. So we, that's how we work. It's great to have touch. But if you're going fast, oftentimes a keyboard or a mouse, especially a little right click, is awesome. Very, very good uh, question. I'll add that to that folder. So later on um, today or tomorrow, that'll be there. And I'm going to keep adding to that folder. So if you want, just for fun, you can check back every so often just for you Max um, listeners. OK, if you have any other questions, please come on up. Love to do it. I just want to do it because we've got other talks. We're already a little bit over time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of Max.